Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's update on COVID-19 in New Brunswick. Speaking on behalf of the province today are Dr. Jennifer Russell, the province's Chief Medical Officer of Health, and the Honorable Blaine Higgs, Premier of New Brunswick. Bon matin à tout le monde et bienvenue à cette mise à jour sur le COVID-19 au Nouveau-Brunswick. Les porte-parole aujourd'hui sont le médecin hygiéniste en chef, le Dr. Jennifer Russell, et le Premier ministre, l'Honorable Blaine Higgs. Dr. Russell. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour à vous tous. Today, we are again reporting no new cases in New Brunswick. Our total remains at 121, with one active case at this time. As you're aware, we did report a new case yesterday in Zone 5, which is the Camelton region, and this involves an individual under the age of 19. Public Health immediately began contact tracing for this case, which remains under investigation. A daycare in Zone 5 has been closed until further notice, and family and staff have been notified as part of the contact tracing process. This is a timely reminder that as far as we have come, we still have a long way to go. And, um, and again, because this is a, a new case that's under investigation, I, I, again, I just want the family members to know that we support them and, and we are doing all the things that we need to do to uh, make sure everybody involved is aware. Nous vivons depuis deux mois un état d'urgence dont le but est de ralentir la propagation du virus responsable de la COVID-19 dans la province. Dans l'intérêt de la protection de la santé publique, nous avons suspendu les activités que nous tenions pour acquises depuis longtemps. The sacrifices that all New Brunswickers have made have enabled us to take the actions being announced today. Our progress through recovery has been measured and deliberate. We have watched at every stage to be sure that the disease did not reappear, but it was known to us that we would eventually see more cases because we have cases all around us on, on, on all of our borders with the exception of PEI, so Nova Scotia, Maine, Quebec, and even beyond. So again, our borders, are, we have border, measures con in, border measure controls in place, but there are still the possibility of people going outside the province and coming back, uh, or people bringing it into the province who have traveled here uh, for essential reasons. So we, we really have to continue continue to move very carefully because, again, this is a global pandemic and until the global pandemic is over, we are going to be in this position. So the yellow phase begins today and will take several weeks to implement. The Premier will provide the details in a few minutes. J'aimerais rappeler à tout le monde qu'il faut continuer à être vigilant. La pandémie est encore euh, globale et aussi en hors de nos frontières, en Québec, en Nouvelle-Écosse, en Maine et d'autres places. Alors, euh, si cela devient nécessaire, nous envisagerons de nouvelles mesures restrictives et nous les adoptons, euh, adopterons s'il le faut pour ralentir la propagation du virus. Ces mesures pourront être prises à l'échelle locale, régionale ou provinciale selon les circonstances. Mais c'est encore vraiment important que les gens suivent les directives de santé publique au niveau de leur protéger leur, leur famille et euh, euh, ceux qui connaissent. C'est vraiment important parce que le COVID-19 va encore être avec nous. Some activities, including restricted, unrestricted travel outside New Brunswick, will continue to be tightly controlled for the foreseeable future. The first actions under the yellow phase, which take effect today, are aimed at widening our circle of contact and activities while continuing to maintain the health of New Brunswickers. But this does not mean the pandemic is over, and it doesn't mean that we would want to see a large number of people gathering and not social distancing. And I know that this can happen, and uh, I am aware that uh, it has been happening. And again, I would really like to discourage people from doing that and encourage people to take all the precautions that they need to protect themselves and their loved ones and every other New Brunswicker here in our province. While society and the economy increase activity and measures are relaxed, please remember, People can be contagious and spread COVID-19 up to two days before you have symptoms and feel sick. That's why everybody still needs to continue to act as if they have COVID-19. So whereby we don't have a whole lot of active cases right now, again, it is still possible to have asymptomatic transmission and we want everybody to stay vigilant. It is really important. It is really important because we want to be able to continue to allow people to have access to the things in society and the economy that are very valuable to them and are valuable to all of us. 
So please limit your close contacts at all times to prevent the spreading to others, especially those who are more vulnerable to complications of COVID-19. Nous devons tous continuer d'agir de manière responsable afin de ralentir la propagation du virus. Si jamais il vient à apparaître et nous devons vous prépa nous préparer en vue d'une éventuelle deuxième vague, ce qui semble très probable. Le plan de rétablissement du Nouveau-Brunswick repose sur notre évaluation de la situation de la COVID-19 dans la province et sur notre capacité à réagir à une résurgence de la transmission que ce soit maintenant ou à l'avenir. Et comme je vous ai dit en anglais, vous pouvez avoir pas de symptômes et même si vous avez des symptômes, vous pouvez transmettre le virus avec pas de symptômes deux jours avant que vous développiez les symptômes. C'est pour ça qu'on devrait tous agir comme on a le COVID-19. On devrait tous agir comme le COVID-19 est encore ici au Nouveau-Brunswick parce que c'est vrai. Et c'est tout à l'entour de nos frontières, en Québec, Ontario, à Nouvelle-Écosse, Maine et d'autres endroits dans les États-Unis. Alors, c'est pour ça qu'on devrait se protéger et protéger notre famille et aussi toutes les gens et tous les citoyens du Nouveau-Brunswick. This is not about achieving an absence of cases, but our ability to act when cases arise, and they will arise. And when they do, our public health teams in each region will react very quickly and do all the things they need to do to protect the population. And if people need to be hospitalized, if they need to have specialized care, that is available also. We are proceeding on the understanding that our public health system has the capacity to test, trace, and isolate cases of COVID-19 as they occur, but we still need the population to cooperate in terms of presenting when they have symptoms, calling 811, and getting tested immediately. Have a very low threshold to get tested, please, and, and, and because, again, everybody in this province will benefit from that. We are proceeding in the knowledge that our healthcare system has the ability to manage new cases without becoming overwhelmed and to respond to local surges as they happen. We are proceeding with the support of employers who have put in place measures to keep their workplaces and employees safe. And the restrictions on our international and interprovincial borders will stay in place to reduce the risk of transmission from imported cases. But the risk is not zero. So as much as we need to do to protect the population, each individual has a responsibility to protect themselves and all of the the citizens of New Brunswick. Most of all, we are moving ahead with your help and support. Your adjustment to this new normal is crucial. Our collective success is the result of thousands upon thousands of individual actions that have helped keep our province safe during this global pandemic, and we will continue to depend on the thousands of New Brunswickers to make good decisions to protect themselves and our province. So keep washing your hands regularly and thoroughly. Don't forget to disinfect commonly touched surfaces in your home. Cough and sneeze into your sleeve. Avoid touching your face. Maintain two meters of distance from others. Please keep your number of close contacts very small. And when you can't socially distance or physically distance, please wear a community mask that covers your mouth and your nose. These are all continually important and critical to our success moving forward. They seem like small things, but they really make a huge difference and have allowed us to have the success that we have had so far. If you feel unwell, it is vital that you stay home. If you are experiencing symptoms of COVID-19, arrange to be tested. This is how we will continue to keep the COVID-19 virus from establishing itself in New Brunswick. And again, we don't know when the second wave is going to happen. We expect there to be a second wave, but I would really like to delay it as long as possible and make sure that it is as small as possible and that the fewest number of people are affected as possible. But I can't do that alone. You need to be active participants engaged in the actions that everyone needs to take to protect our province. Please keep doing these things because they will save lives. Nous sommes en droit d'éprouver une grande fierté devant le succès remporté par le Nouveau-Brunswick jusqu'à maintenant. Néanmoins, chaque étape de notre rétablissement va comporter ces nouveaux défis. Et comme je dis en anglais, je ne peux pas protéger le, la population entière par moi-même. C'est vraiment quelque chose que chaque individu devrait prendre responsabilité pour protéger les gens du Nouveau-Brunswick. Tout, J'ai toutefois confiance que nous serons capables de relever ces défis à mesure que nous nous ajusterons à notre nouvelle normalité. Ensemble, nous avons accompli tant de choses, alors ne lâchons pas. Merci beaucoup.
Good morning. Bonjour. Before I begin today, I want to acknowledge all those affected by the fire at Les Pesseries de Chenu plant in Valcomo yesterday. My thoughts are with the impacted workers. In fact, I spoke to the general manager, Poulain Savoie, uh, just before this, this press release and discussed the impact certainly in the community and, and what, was, what we were able to do to assist in, in this regard. And, and Mr. Savoir advised me that they were working with the fishermen, they're working with other industries in the area uh, to find ways to process a lobster and keep things moving. And, and I was uh, very encouraged by, by his uh, optimism to deal with the situation that obviously is very difficult. Um, during that discussion as well, he, um, we, we discussed, uh, you know, uh, the worker situation and uh, obviously, and he referenced uh, his facility at, um, at Bay St. Anne. And he said that um, Bay St. Anne is running at 120 percent uh, capacity. And he said largely due from the student, uh, uh, the student population that is in, he's engaged. He said, unlike ever before, he's had students uh, be engaged in his processing plant. You know, given, given kind of where we are right now with the, the, that whole issue, which we will discuss here shortly, uh, that was encouraging news because, um, you know, we've seen the, the students in that area and, and we've heard about the students in, in other areas, certainly from UDM, from Sackville that have participated in the, in the Shediac Dayup region as well. So it's, um, you know, there's some uh, bright lights in that area that I think will help us to, to expand our, um, our knowledge of what we have here in our province. But with Mr. Savoy, I, I was encouraged by his optimism as he deals with the current situation and obviously um, looking forward to, to seeing the, that facility uh, rebuild it at some point in the future. We did not get into that discussion, but uh, I'm optimistic in that regard. Our Department of Agriculture, Aquaculture and Fisheries and the Department of Post-Secondary Education, Training and Labor will work with the plant owners and we will do all that we can for these workers to find that they find uh, new interim employment or employment as, as necessary during these, this tough time. Starting today, we are moving into phase three or the yellow phase of recovery. Since we began our phased recovery plan, we've had minimal cases of COVID-19. We have all been a part of achieving this and I want to thank all New Brunswickers for the continued cooperation and patience. En tant que province, nous avons travaillé ensemble et nous avons démontré notre capacité de contrôler la transmission des virus. Grâce à tous ces efforts, nous pouvons maintenant autoriser un plus grand nombre de services et d'entreprises à ouvrir leurs portes. We want to make sure businesses and the public have time to adapt to the yellow phase, so we will introduce these new changes slowly. The following changes are effective immediately. In, these, in this phase, New Brunswickers can extend their two household bubble. You can now spend time with the close friends and family members who you would normally see on a regular basis. We are recommending, however, that indoor gatherings be limited to 10 people or fewer. So it's not like inviting your ball team home or, or uh, having a house party, but it is the next step to get in together and to the new norm under COVID-19. We're asking you to keep your circle of friends and family as, as small and reasonable as possible, especially if you have a vulnerable person in your family or a child who attends daycare. Starting today, non-regulated health professionals such as acupuncturists and the naturopaths are allowed to open if they choose, as well as personal service businesses, including barbers, hairstylists, spas, esthetician, and tattoo artists. Not all of us are able to do our own hair. So <laughs> these businesses need to respect physical distancing measures, except when clients are receiving services. Next Friday, May 29th, additional restrictions will be lifted. Les rassemblements publics de 50 personnes au moins seront autorisés à l'extérieur en respectant les majeures de distanciation physique. De plus, les services religieux avec 50 personnes au moins seront autorisés à l'intérieur, seulement si la distanciation physique peut être respectée. Le nombre maximal des personnes qui peuvent se rassembler sera révisé régulièrement et il pourra changer selon le niveau de risque dans la province. Regional health authorities will increase the number of elective surgeries they perform and the number of other non-emergency services will increase. This will be done in a progressive manner to ensure the safety of patients and staff. 
Low contact sports activities will also be able to operate as per the guidance provided by them by their national or provincial organization. As long as they identify ways to limit the number and intensity of close contact during play. Tous les ligues sportives provinciales régulièrement et locales devront avoir un plan opérationnel. Les ligues de jeunes, de jeunes doivent de s'assurer que le nombre de spectateurs qui assistent au match est limité à un adulte par enfant. Des efforts raisonnables doivent être faits pour respecter autant que possible la distanciation physique pendant les activités sportives. Sports organizations can contact the Sport and Recreational Branch of the Department of Tourism, Heritage and Culture for more information. A number of other services will be allowed to open next Friday, May 29th, as long as sanitization requirements are met and physical distancing measures are in place. These include swimming pools, saunas and water parks, gym, local um, yoga studios and dance studios, rinks and indoor recreational facilities, and pool halls and bowling alleys. After much consideration and discussion with the All-Party Cabinet Committee on COVID-19, we have also made the decision to allow temporary foreign workers to re-enter the province as of May 29th. We are still prioritizing the safety of the Brunswickers, but as we restart our economy, we also have to find ways to meet the needs of the agriculture and seafood sectors. Our plan was always to allow temporary foreign workers to enter the province once it was safe to do so. Our plan was also always to ensure that the farmers and the fishermen and the processors would have the workforce they need. While we have made great strides in, in terms of identifying um, individuals, whether they be students or other, um, other individuals who have, have come forward, I think the total may be in the 400 range, um, it is necessary to ensure that additional workers will be available. Now that we have consulted with experts, including public health authorities, we have determined that the risk to New Brunswickers is low as long as safety measures remain in place including the 14 days of isolation before they can start working. Finally, beginning on Friday, May, June 19th, overnight camps will be allowed to open. Les camps de vacances devront mettre en place la mesure de sécurité fournie par la santé publique. Ces mesures comprennent la distanciation physique, un nettoyage amélioré et un processus de dispatage des enfants, des parents, et des employés. Les camps de vacances devront aussi préparer un plan opérationnel avant d'ouvrir. Right now, New Brunswick is in an enviable position. We have the opportunity to reopen our economy while still protecting the safety of our residents. We have limited the spread of COVID-19 within our borders. Now we can focus more on supporting businesses and organizations as we all adjust to the new normal. We are still facing a global pandemic, and this will continue to bring about unforeseen challenges. But we also have the unique opportunity to reinvent the way New Brunswick does business. En prenant les bonnes décisions maintenant, nous pourrons être dans une position de force pour l'avenir. We have shown that we're able to accomplish much when we work together toward a shared goal. I'm excited how we will continue on that path. And we will continue on that path successfully because the success thus far has been related to the tremendous cooperation that we've seen throughout this province in following the compliance of public health in looking at ways to do things differently and to rebuild New Brunswick like it has never been rebuilt before. Thank you, merci. Thank you, Premier Higgs. Thank you, Dr. Russell. Merci, Monsieur le Premier ministre et Dr. Russell. Nous allons maintenant procéder aux questions des journalistes. Vous avez toujours le droit de poser vos questions dans la langue de votre choix. Chaque journaliste aura une question. We will now proceed with questions from the media. You have the right to pose your question in the language of your choice, and each reporter will have one question. Adam Harris, Telegraph Journal. Uh, thanks, Bruce. Uh, 
question for, I believe, both Dr. Russell and, and Premier Higgs. Is there any kind of warning to New Brunswickers today that if they don't follow social distancing rules and businesses don't follow protocols, that they'll be pushed back inside? Um, can you reiterate the threshold where that would happen? Well, certainly on the business side, all of the uh, public engagement sessions with those different organizations have taken place. And so they have guidance around how to do the social distancing, physical distancing within their organizations and businesses. Um, and, and they are responsible for that. We still have the ability to have people call in complaints around that and, um, and do some follow up around that. Uh, and then for people in public, obviously, uh, that is still encouraged at all times, with the exception of the people uh, who are your very close uh, family and friends. So we're continuing to encourage people to physically distance. And uh, that is going to be the guidance in perpetuity while we wait for a vaccine. Do you have anything to add? No. Thank you, Mr. Harris. <laughs> Kevin Bissett, Canadian Press. Uh, yeah, I, I expect this to be for Dr. Russell. Dr. Russell, will you be releasing new modeling? Uh, I know you released modeling when we started this all, but uh, will you be releasing new modeling to show what the next few months uh, will look like, perhaps, and uh, when a possible second wave may uh, come to the province? Uh, right now, there is no plan to do any more modeling at this point in time. I think what we're doing right now is we're looking back at all the information that we've gained uh, and experience that we've gained since early March on our response thus far so that we can be prepared for the next wave and use all of the information again that we've received. And then whatever new information, we continue to meet with our colleagues from Public Health Agency of Canada and the um, uh, Chief Medical Officers of Health from around the around the country so that as new information uh, is available, we can combine that with the experience that we've just gone through and make sure that whatever our approaches are, uh, are going to incorporate all of that. So we are actually having planning sessions right now for that next wave. Um, and again, all that information will be incorporated into our, our planning and preparation. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Mr. Bissett. Silas Brown, Global TV. Hi, Dr. Russell. Uh, you said during your, your remarks that you're aware of gatherings that have been uh, uh, too large and, and, and not following uh, the current public health rules happening already. And, and you're also still continuing, continuing to ask people to keep close contact uh, as low as possible. But uh, you're also kind of throwing open the doors today um, that's going to give you a lot of freedom determining uh, who they come in close contact with. And I'm just wondering how you reconcile that advice. Well, again, it's about balancing those risks and it's about trusting the public to do the right thing. Um, and, and again, we, we have to be able to function as a society. We have to be able to function with an economy and looking at all the social determinants of health. Those things are really important. So where people have this new freedom, it is really important that everybody understands the risks, that everybody still continues to act as if they have COVID-19. They have to continue to act that that COVID-19 is probably still circulating within the province and will continue to do so while our borders and outside of our borders uh, have cases are all around us in, in different jurisdictions. And so, yes, we have good border measure controls in place right now, but that does not stop COVID-19 from being brought into the province at any time. And so, yes, I hear what you're saying and how do you justify that? And I think it is just a balance of again, what the public has been able to uh, understand and cooperate and comply with thus far, and using really good judgment and trusting that they will make good decisions moving forward, knowing that their decisions individually have an impact on the collective success of New Brunswick. So uh, all of the triggers and all of the established criteria for opening are in place right now. Some of those criteria include having, again, all of the public health resources necessary, hospital um, hospital access necessary, having uh, the having ongoing continued public health 
communications and messaging uh, and continuing to have that level of cooperation and understanding to move forward. So we have all the criteria in place to move forward. And again, this is the, the next phase in, in where we're at right now. Um, and, and we do have to continue to be aware that things can change at any time. And, and I think that's the piece that, that really needs to be driven home is that our situation can change at any time. There is no guarantee at this moment in time. And um, not to be flippant or, or, or um, making light of it, but you know, with, with, with this power comes responsibility. So every New Brunswicker is being empowered with a certain amount of responsibility to protect their fellow citizens right now. And that uh, we do encourage them to take that responsibility very, very seriously because it will impact vulnerable populations. It will impact vulnerable people. It will impact uh, institutions. So there are there are domino effects and ripple effects from all of these decisions. So we are all connected, and that reminds me of the the Avatar film where there's the, the all the white connections in the background with 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 everything. So we are all intimately connected when it comes to COVID. This is a global pandemic. We live on this planet with COVID-19 all around us. We, we actually can't get away from it. We are not on an island where we can shut down the borders completely and not let anybody in. So we are going to live with this for a very long time. And we all have to become very, very comfortable and aware that the risks will be with us until we get a vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Michel Corriveau, Radio Canada. Oui, c'est une question pour uh, Dr. Russell. Alors, euh, Dr. Russell, j'aimerais savoir, euh, pour ce qui est de la famille et des amis, j'aimerais que vous nous disiez peut-être euh, qu'est-ce que ça veut dire, parce que ça semble très large et ça semble finalement euh, laisser euh, l'impression qu'on laisse tomber l'essentiel du confinement. Et euh, après ça, si vous aviez euh, deux secondes, peut-être commenter un peu l'histoire des travailleurs étrangers, comment ça va se passer. Oh, j'ai pas, j'ai pas entendu ta deuxième question, mais je vais commencer avec la première. Alors, pour les directives, pour la phase de jaune, oui, je comprends. C'est, c'est, ça sonne qu'il y a, il y a bien moins de limites euh, sur les gens de, euh, à ce niveau de confine, confinement. Et je suis d'accord avec vous, mais c'est balancer les risques de la population pour avoir la chance à visiter des familles très proches des amis très proches. Alors, ça ne veut pas dire qu'on veut que des gens euh, avoir une, une fête ou une party dans leur, euh, leur sous-sol. Ce n'est pas ça qu'on veut. On veut que les gens soient capables de faire des décisions pour avoir le contact avec leurs proches. Alors oui, on dit c'est on, on veut pas les nombres euh, sont plus hauts de 10 euh, et, euh, et vraiment c'est le, le plus qu'on peut limiter les contacts étroits. Ça veut dire que on a moins de chances à transmettre le Covid-19. Alors euh, on dit pas que c'est on veut pas que vous vous téléphonez toute votre équipe de, de hockey pour faire un, un, un party. Alors c'est c'est vraiment utiliser votre jugement, être très responsable. C'est vraiment pour connecter avec des amis très proche et la famille très proche, mais pas dans des grands nombres. Merci, M. Corriveau. Vicky Hogarth, Charlotte County TV. Thank you, Bruce. My question is for the Premier. Premier Higgs, some New Brunswickers are wondering how Prince Edward Island's decision to allow seasonal residents to enter the province as a June 1st will affect New Brunswick. Will these travelers who are passing through by car be able to stop freely in New Brunswick? And do you suspect you will be opening up New Brunswick to seasonal residents in the near future? So we'll continue to work with the island and, and, the, and the public health officials in both provinces to determine kind of the next phase of, of, uh, of our alignment going forward. The, uh, we have, a, you know, from the beginning allowed people to come through New Brunswick to get to other provinces. I mean, I, I think that's an obligation we, we certainly would, would, uh, would have and, and we would agree with. So that, that will continue. And, and as a, uh, you know, a province makes a decision in relation to um, seasonal uh, residents, then um, we, we should uh, we should be able to ensure that when they come to our borders, they, they have a reason why they're coming. I understand that PEI is going to have a very um, strong, solid um, kind of an application process so that residents are, are well um, understood and that I would assume they would share that with us so we can share that with our officials at the border and, um, and we can get uh, certainly continued compliance 
through the province. Thank you, Premier. Thank you, Ms. Hogarth. Matthew Wakomo, Lakadzi Nouvelle. Bonjour, ma question est probablement pour uh, Dr. Russell. J'aimerais savoir comment ça va fonctionner pour la prochaine phase, la, la phase verte. On sait déjà que dans deux semaines, euh, dans, non, dans une semaine en fait, il va y avoir d'autres étapes de déconfinement. Je me demandais si euh, on peut s'attendre à voir autre chose par la suite dans deux, dans trois semaines avant, sans nécessairement qu'on qu qu passe à la, à la phase verte. Euh, donc pour résumer, à quoi on peut s'attendre en termes de, de prochaines étapes de déconfinement dans deux, trois et plusieurs semaines? Oui, je vous comprends. Les, les prochaines étapes, il y a seulement une phase maintenant qu'on parle, c'est la phase jaune. Puis ce qu'on avait dit, c'est qu'il va y avoir une coupe de semaines entre chaque chose qui va arriver dans la phase jaune. La phase verte ne va jamais arriver avant qu'on aura un, un vaccin. Merci, docteur. Merci, Monsieur Roy. Comment? Mia Urquhart, CBC. My question is for the premier. Now that we're moving into the third stage, why is service new workers not offering greater service, but instead is still stuck at the appointment only stage, according to the government website? Ms. Urquhart, can you repeat that, please? Sure. Now that we're moving into the third stage, why is Service New Brunswick not offering greater service, but instead is still stuck at the appointment only stage, according to the government website? Well, yes, it, that, that's true, but it will allow us to move, move on in this, in this um, next phase with government services as well. I, I think that we have found uh, the extent that we've been applying services and, and what's going on online has worked very well. Uh, I think we're seeing more and more activity online. We've seen, we've seen a transition in many ways uh, to improve government services through the necessity of dealing with this pandemic. So government will continue to, I guess, evolve, but in some ways, um, we want to learn from what, what we have um, experienced over this past two months, and, and can we raise the bar on our, our ability to serve public in a new and more efficient way? Um, so I, I'll, I mean, Service to Brunswick will, will evaluate their practices from the past and what they've learned, and then we'll implement going forward as, as, uh, as we need to. Thank you, Premier. Thank you, Mr. Kirk. In the NTR huddle today. Good morning. Uh, my question is for Premier Higgs. Um, Premier, you know, farmers have been calling for the temporary foreign worker ban to be reversed for a few weeks, and now some of them are saying that it's too late to get their uh, usual temporary foreign workers in and some of those workers have already gotten jobs elsewhere in Canada, and some of them have their work permits cancelled. Um, what led you to uh, make the decision to reverse that ban now and not earlier? Thank you. Well, the reason the ban was in, in place in the, in the first place would be similarly to how all the other restrictions that we had in place commencing back in, in March. Um, so if, if you looked at our condition in March and you looked at where we were on the curve and what, what that might look like, um, he was said, well, you might ask that same question about every decision was made and why are we changing it now? Well, we're changing it now because for two reasons. One is that we're in a, in a good position because, um, you know, I think, you know, people have, have certainly followed the rules uh, of public health and, and we're, we're in a good position. Our, our border security has been good, so um, we're in a, in a new decision point. Uh, and in relation to the the actual number of um, positions available and the number of, of employees that were available did not match up to meet the needs of whether it be the farmers um, and in some cases certainly the fish processors um, um, as well. So, so in both cases there's a need that hasn't been filled. I think that um, it's recognizing that, that um, we, we need to do that. I said from the beginning we would do that. I have spoken to, or, or my, the departments have spoken to different um, different groups, and while they they are you know concerned about their their work season, I, I I've got the certainly the message that it's um, they just need to see workers now. I think even today, listening to one uh, certainly an individual represent, representing the farmers group talking about what she would hope to hear today in this announcement. So I think what she's heard is exactly what she hoped to hear. And, um, and while, you know, uh, some may think uh, our, uh, our situation has, uh, is too late, uh, I guess we can work with those individual groups to understand uh, the reality of that. Thank you, Premier. Thank you.
Producing TR. Shing Fowler, CBC. Uh, my question is for Dr. Ruffle. Uh, in the yellow phase, the infographic provided by public health says the visitation of vulnerable, the, the vulnerable population will now fall under basic controls. Uh, can you explain exactly what this means and if this includes long care, uh, long term care homes? Um, I'm not sure which infographic you have in front of you because there, there has been an updated one. And what we're doing right now is we are looking across the entire system from long-term care facilities and also to hospitals, uh, palliative care, et cetera. And we're looking at the visitation uh, policies right now because we are planning to make some changes. So uh, some of that was brought to the task force this morning and we'll have some more things to announce around that very soon. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Fowler. François Leblanc, Radio Canada. Oui, une question pour le Dr. Russell. Vous avez parlé de, de sport et puis de, de permettre des sports avec des contacts limités, mais dans le monde du sport, il y a encore un, un certain flou. Pourriez-vous préciser un peu euh, qu'est-ce que ça va pouvoir dire pour, par exemple, les sports de contact, les, les sports organisés vis-à-vis euh, -vis, euh, ceux qui font des courses, des compétitions comme euh, on parle de les matchs de soccer, vis-à-vis, -vis, par exemple, euh, le marathon. Alors, euh, on avait déjà eu des réunions avec le département de tourisme euh, qui contient ceux qui sont en charge de, des sports. Alors, euh, eux, ils ont des informations pour faire des connexions avec des, des associations comme telles. Et aussi, on a reçu de, des directives du, de l'Agence de santé publique du Canada pour donner des, euh, des, 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 euh, la manière pour assesser les risques et comment faire les différents sports en sécurité. Merci, docteur. Merci, M. Leblanc. Laura Brown, CTV. Hi there. Dr. Russell, on April 24th, you had said if uh, we see three outbreaks of COVID-19 not related to one another in a six-day period, what can you go into a mass gathering that cannot be fully traced? Uh, we'll move immediately back to the restrictions that were in place prior to the reopening phase that we're in now. Um, so, with respect to the triggers for going back to the red phase, uh, we are constantly reassessing that information and so we, we are actually having conversations about are these triggers still the same ones that we uh, think are the most important and the answer is yes. Uh, would red look exactly the same? Possibly not. Um, so we're, my, the, um, uh, the public health team reviewed all of the information yesterday. Again, this is an evolving situation, so we want to make sure that we have the most up-to-date and most evidence-based information. And again, looking back at the last uh, two and a half months around what has been successful, what has worked really well, and what would we tweak and do differently uh, if we had to go back to red again. So, so that information is, is being uh, worked on as we speak. and. Um, um, and uh, and so that way, again, we have the most up-to-date and relevant information as we make decisions moving further. But the trigger itself ha will remain the same. There are other triggers that are broader than that that include, you know, do we have the right resources? Do we have enough contact tracing? Do we have enough testing capacity? Do we have enough personal protective equipment? Do we have the right amount of hospital beds, et cetera, et cetera? So there's, there's more than just one trigger, but the main one that we're all worried about is, again, if we were to see three cases of unlimited linked community transmission in a six-day period and there are other again there are other triggers as well in terms of outbreaks and and we would look at um, uh, um, changing things at a regional level if we needed to as well so it may not involve the entire province but it could be applied at the regional level which is the guidance from um, uh, Public Health Agency of Canada that we have these criteria we build um, all of these uh, decision-making protocols around what we need to do at what time, but each jurisdiction will apply that to their own data, their own situation, and, and, and it could be even on a regional basis. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Elizabeth Fraser, CBC. Nine 
so the bubble is a complicated issue with respect to how do you expand your bubble so that it's still safe and you still maintain the, the smallest number of close contacts possible. The original bubble idea came from New Zealand and it was around mitigating the isolation and mental health issues around people who lived alone being alone and, and having those negative mental health impacts. So that original bubble concept was as a result of trying to allow people who lived alone and were isolated and were having mental health issues as a result of that to, to mitigate that while decrease, while continuing to maintain a very small number of close contacts during the, the, the lockdown situation. Uh, so if somebody chose to have a two household bubble with, with, with a, uh, an isolated uh, single person living alone or a family or what have you, I mean, those were decisions that each individual household had to make for themselves. As we expand that situation, obviously um, it, it's you know, it's the, the concept in terms of the principles behind what we want people to do is still the same. We still want people to have the lowest number of close contacts possible. We do want people to have certain freedoms. We don't really want people congregating in those large numbers. We certainly want people to be able to visit with close family and close friends that they haven't been able to see uh, for a very long time. Thank you, Dr. Russell. Thank you, Ms. Fraser. Tom Bateman, Times and Transcript. Oh, good morning. For Premier Higgs, uh, building off of Dickie's question earlier, there seems to be increased frustration about the rigor of interprovincial border protections. For example, business groups in Westmoreland County and Nova Scotia's Cumberland County, uh, where there have been no COVID-19 cases, uh, propose an economic bubble to allow vital trade lanes to renew. What do you as Premier need to see start opening up those borders in this sort of fashion? Or say, by, you know, by allowing seasonal residence in, as was said by PEI earlier this week. Uh, and, and, and I guess just what do you want the Brunswickers to expect or understand in terms of changes to, to policy around border restrictions? Thank you. Well, firstly, I think it's important to Brunswickers understand that, that we're able to allow the, the freedom inside the province because of the position we're in right now in relation to the, the number of active cases and, and, the, and the pandemic within New Brunswick borders. So that is why we're able to move at, at, this, uh, at this pace, albeit recognizing the, the risk of doing so. So any f changes, in, and we've also said previously that, that borders are our main uh, line of defense here. And I know that communities that live right on the border, um, it, it is a special challenge. But through this, we've also, you know, recognized the essential service component, the uh, the economic component of businesses moving and, and projects being done, because it's important that that we actually uh, keep the economy moving. And as we ramp up with these changes, there will be more activity in that regard. So looking forward into into the next phase, and you know, continued discussions with public health. What does it look like when we would be able to have seasonal residents come here uh, that own that own properties? Um, depends greatly on on where they're coming from and and um, and what what exposure exists. So we weren't ready to um, collectively in conjunction with public health to make that decision um, at this time. Uh, we recognize the pressure will continue to rise, um, particularly as we get into the the summer months. And, and it'll be particularly, it'll rise based on, you know, what we've seen happening in the provinces, the nearby provinces. So at this point, I would just like uh, for residents to be thankful for the position we're in, to be, to be thankful for the opportunity we have now to open up in our society here in our province, to be cognizant of the rules being followed so we can continue to grow our economy. I, I believe we have the capability, we have the potential to restart New Brunswick um, in a way that, that um, many provinces will, will, will wish they were in that position. Uh, but I also believe we could lose it quickly. So it's important that patients continue to be exercised, understanding continues to be exercised, and we see that we are moving in a, in, in a pace that is faster than most, and it's, um, it's in recognition of the great work and how people all over this province have stepped up to keep um, the health and welfare of themselves and their fellow citizens uh, secure. Thank you, Premier. Thank you, Mr. Bateman. Derwin Gowan, Quadi Tides. Bill Hunt, Daily Gleaner. 
Uh, good morning. My question is for the Premier, I, I guess. Um, can you uh, define, sir, what you mean by low contact sports and how individual sports will meet that standard? Hi there. So we have had some sessions with uh, tourism and heritage uh, around sports activities. So through Public Health and actually the Public Health Agent of Canada, there are guidance documents to help sports uh, associations understand what they can and can't do and how to make their sports as safe as possible. So that guidance exists and the meetings have already taken place with um, that government deport department and they will continue to engage with individual associations on that. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. <clears throat> Savannah Odd, Telegraph Journal. Hi, Premier. Um, do you have a sense of how many of the foreign workers that we were scheduled to originally receive in April that we are still able to bring in now? Um, and if that number has shrunk, um, how is the province actively trying to compensate for any, any losses, I guess, in that number? Well, I think that the the point in the exercise was um, was certainly uh, providing workers in another fashion. We do have um, we do have access and have worked with all the employers in in relation to saying how many do you need and when do you need them. So we actually have a timetable of of the needs. So as as you know, when the when the, uh, the when I first put the the ban on temporary foreign workers, I think there was 175 that were coming at that point. Uh, that would be isolating and available like May 15th or in that range. Um, the, um, the, the idea in, in April 15th, maybe it was. But anyway, the idea was that, that we certainly um, were looking and working with companies based on the timelines they needed. So I, I, I'm not suggesting that there's a, there's a compensation formula here. I'm suggesting we're allowing now based on the, the, the health pandemic uh, situation that we can once again look at farm workers to come in to meet the needs of the employers. Uh, you know, I think that we, we've seen we've seen companies, we've seen issues all over the province, all over the country, where companies have shut down and they shut down because we were in a health pandemic. Um, you know, we'll we'll all we'll all be um, dealing with that in our own way. But my goal right now is to allow people to get up and running, and to do it as quickly as possible maybe do it faster than than uh, than others may and and be have companies be able to get back into an economic um prosperity way of life which is which is of course what we're trying to achieve here thank you sorry, Premier. thank you Ms. I just, could, sorry could i just get a quick clarification i wasn't trying to suggest a monetary compensation i was more asking just about recruiting efforts like if we have a smaller number able to come in now what is the province doing to recruit Sorry, I should have uh, used better wording the first time. Well, in the case of recruitment, the, you know, the the applications would already be made to the federal government, and if the approval has been done, the, these applications are made well in advance, and so they would have been delayed because of um, you know the ban that was on here, and and so it'll be it'll be processed through the federal government. We'll work with the uh, with the local. Uh, employer in order to um, with the federal government to expedite that but but that is a process that's set up like months in advance um, and we had people that all of a sudden said I need temporary farm workers who never made any applications so you, you kind of say well where'd that list come from um, but in this case we're we're working with the ones who have already made applications and are now working with the federal government to see those applications filled thank you Premier. thank you Mr. Nadia Gaudreau Adio oui, bonjour. J'ai une question concernant euh, le cas dans le nord de la province. Je pense que c'est une question pour Dr. Russell. Euh, Est-ce que l'enfant a fréquenté plus qu'un milieu de garde et euh, combien de personnes sont en isolement? Combien de personnes sont en isolement? Et est-ce qu'on pense augmenter le nombre de tests, euh, du, euh, entre autres de, du, des employés, du personnel de, des, des milieux de garde en général? Alors, comme euh, tous les cas, euh, n'importe quand ou n'importe où dans la province, depuis le commencement de mars, le processus pour la santé publique, euh, nos, nos équipes régionales vont suivre les mêmes protocoles pour chaque cas. Et dans chaque cas, ils vont identifier le cas, ils vont identifier tous les contacts étroits, ils vont appeler tous les contacts étroits et déterminer qui a besoin d'être testé, qui a besoin euh, d'être isolé. Et s'il y a quelque chose 
qui, vo qui devrait être faire au, au niveau d'une euh, garderie ou euh, une institution. Ça, ça va être communiqué aussi avec euh, notre, notre euh, équipe régionale. Et à ce moment-ci, je peux vous dire que l'équipe régionale travaille vraiment fort pour faire toutes les choses qu'on devrait faire pour protéger les gens euh, qui ont venu en contact avec euh, le cas. Et au fur et à mesure qu'on a d'autres informations qu'on peut partager, on, on, va, on va le partager, mais à ce moment-ci, c'est vraiment euh, quelque chose qui est euh, sous investigation maintenant. Ils vont continuer leur travail et, euh, et c'est vraiment tout ce que je peux partager à ce moment-ci. Derwin Gowan. Before we conclude, I'd just like to announce that future news conferences and news release regarding COVID-19 will be scheduled and issued as required. Up-to-date information about COVID-19, including the latest, test number, latest testing numbers in New Brunswick, will continue to be available online each and every day at www.gmb.ca coronavirus. À l'avenir, les conférences de presse liées à la COVID-19 seront organisées lorsque les circonstances les justifient et les communiqués de presse seront émis au besoin. Les renseignements les plus récents au sujet de la COVID-19, y compris les tests de dépistage au Nouveau-Brunswick, seront encore disponibles en ligne chaque jour à l'adresse suivante www.gnb.ca coronavirus. That concludes today's update. Thank you very much. Voilà la fin de notre mise à jour. Merci beaucoup. This is Rogers TV, New Brunswick.